I'll give you a Ford pickup truck and I want you to win the Formula One race. Will you do it? I think I could have won even with that. 38 years ago, where were you? Half of me was in my mom and half of me was in my dad. <laughs> you didn't exist, man. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please give a recommendation for a first read uh, on the inner, inner manual, please, that you would recommend? We are misunderstanding memory as intelligence. You should be absolutely 100% passionate about every breath that you take. All of you, the ra racing fraternity, to stand up for soil. Yeah, I am always on metaverse. When you truly realize I do not know, then everything enhances itself and it's a metaverse all the time. I want every human being to be on metaverse. In a way, literature is metaverse. Metaverse is a much, much more powerful device. Uh, Sadhguru, you're speaking about racing. Do you think it's a human-made concept? Speed crushes time and space, but let it not be your bones. Hello Sadhguru, uh, such a pleasure to speak Namaskara. to you. Hopefully we can manage to inspire uh, all the young generations watching us. Um, the topics we're going to cover, you know, is like mind, mindset and manifestation. Um, and maybe if it's okay for you, where, where are we finding you? Right now I'm in Tennessee uh, at Isha Institute of Inner Sciences. We are a large center here and uh, we are in the process of building infrastructure for, you know, disseminating technologies for inner well-being. That's what this center is about. So, this is a large center in the mountains. We are nearly 20,000 acres with a very dedicated band of people uh, manifesting this. And uh, in the next few years, you will see the immensity of what it, this is. A lot of people are working on this right now. I'm sorry, disseminating. Do you mean it's like a technology detox or on the contrary, creating technologies for well-being? <laughs> I didn't understand. See, technologies for inner well-being means... See, when we say technology, everybody is thinking of their phone, their computer or their car or whatever. But uh, the most sophisticated and uh, most uh, top-end technology in the world is the human system. There's no better technology than this, whether it's mechanics or electronics or electricals, this is the thing. So, but uh, people are going about using such a high technology without even reading the user's manual. <laughs> that is why human life seems to be so complicated and a big struggle. Though we are invested with so much intelligence and competence and variety of faculties, all these faculties are turning against individual human beings. They are suffering their own mind, their own body, because uh, they have not read the user's manual. So, this is about inner technologies, not external technologies. Sadhguru, can you please give a recommendation for a first read uh, on the inner inner manual, please, that you would <laughs> recommend? Where can uh, where can everybody who's listening to us now find that? The simple thing is, uh, the first and most basic thing is, you must take away the misconceptions that you have about yourself or the nature of yourself. You may not know what you are, but at least you must know what you are not. Well, uh, for example, the physical body that we carry, when we were born, we were only so much, now we became this much. It is just the food that we have eaten. The food that we have eaten is just the... Uh, a piece of the planet or soil that we walk upon. So, what is soil became food, what is food became body. We gathered this, we accumulated this. What we accumulate can be ours, but can never ever be us. So, it belongs to us, but it's not us. And all the time it's changing. Your body, what it was yesterday, what it is today, is to a certain percentage different. In a year's time, it's completely different. So, this idea that this is me, identifying you yourself with your physical form, itself is causing enormous confusion. And also the same goes for the mental structure. Everything that you have in your mind is an accumulation from what you have perceived from around you, right from the moment of your birth. So, if you know how to distance yourself from these two heaps, heaps of impressions which we call as mind, heap of food that we call as body, if you can stay little away from that, you have a completely uh, uh, different perspective which gives you a certain sense of freedom about how you conduct your body and how you conduct your mind. Right now, human beings are largely suffering their mind and body, not the world that they live in. There is a simple process called Isha Kriya, 
which is downloadable, free of cost for everybody available. Millions of people are practicing this around the world. It's called Isha Kriya, I-S-H-A, Isha and Kriya, K-R-I-Y-A, Isha Kriya. If they download this, everybody can do it in any kind of situation, you can do it. You can put on headphones and do it wherever you are from your phone. This will give you a certain perspective, a little distance from physical body and mental structures, because there are only two kinds of sufferings in human life. One is uh, mental suffering and physical suffering. If there's a little space, you are beyond suffering, and this is very important. If you have to think straight, if you have to see life and perceive life the way it is, you must be free from suffering. When you're suffering, you don't see things right. And this can be found on your website? Uh, yes, web. It's on the app. It's very easily available on the app. Okay. Well, I can, I can relate um, because, I mean, I was a Formula One driver and I also, I didn't manage to have that distance to, to the Nico Formula One driver and the real Nico uh, person, you know, and, and I really became that Formula One driver with everything and it just, it created a lot of confusion also, uh, also for myself. So I've been working on really getting this distance uh, ever since. That's a dangerous thing. You can race on the track, but you can't race through life. Because we, okay. yeah, on the track, you want to get to the finish line first. In life, you don't want to get to the finish line first, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Sadhguru, if I may, is it okay for me to, uh, to jump into some, some uh, question on education? Any kind of question. Whatever I know, I will say. But I want to warn you that I'm an uneducated person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then... Uh, I think uh, everybody can, can be very reassured because if you're un uneducated, then that gives us a lot of hope in general. <laughs> um, may, I, may I ask, so what is, um, is our current education system, what is it missing most at the moment in your point of view? See, we are misunderstanding memory as intelligence. This is the biggest mistake education systems are doing. So right now, you are in a, let's say, uh, in a high school, and how are you considered as the most intelligent student? You have big memory. Well, your phone has better memory than you. Uh, now they say, telling me my phone has one, what? Not gigabyte, what's the next one? Huh? Tera. My phone has one terabyte. Uh, do you have one terabyte in your head? I don't think so. So, I'm saying memory is not intelligence. Memory is useful for survival. Intelligence is a completely different aspect of life. Unfortunately, our educa education systems are, are overly invested towards memory. The leaning towards memory is too heavy. If you can read a textbook and vomit the textbook on the examination day, you're considered brilliant and number one. So this has to change that it is not about enhancing memory. As technology progresses, you storing up memory in your head is meaningless. There was a time, if you can repeat a book backwards in your head, that was considered a great virtue. It is no more of any importance because there are devices which can do better than you. No human memory is as efficient as a recorded instrument, all right? Human memory can get fudged within yourself, but human mind is to be used for its intelligence. Intelligence which is unsullied by memory, this is very, very important if you have to break ground all the time. See, right now, you see, for example, we started with a... Uh, I'll not go back too much further back, let's say we started with the steam engine. When the steam engine came, we thought this is the greatest thing. It was fuming like crazy, black smoke, and we were so excited. Looking at this black store, smoke and white steam, and the thing started moving, we were so excited. Today, we think this is the most horrible thing, we must ban this one. And now we are looking at an electric car. But believe me, in another twenty-five years, we'll be looking at car, electric car as some kind of a horror. That will also come to us. It is not far away. So, we are going in these stages because we are going... We are too invested and entangled in our own memory. It's very important, education systems have to uh, cultivate human intelligence and creativity and genius in the children. Instead of nourishing and cultivating, we are running schools like correctional institutions. It's like you got to be there, you have to do this, you do this, this and this. I will tell you my experience of school, it never made any sense to me. I went and sat there, somebody comes and starts talking biology. 
one hour, tongue, bell rings, another guy starts coming and talking English literature, tongue, bell rings, another guy starts talking about algebra, tongue, bell rings, somebody else talks chemistry. What is this nonsense? By the time I process it, this guy is talking another subject and another subject. Right now, we are running schools like this. If you start mathematics, next three days only mathematics will happen. Totally invested in that. And when they're done with one concept, we will see how to connect that to some other dimension of... Uh, or some other discipline of learning and then you take that on. Because there is no process, there's no application, just memory. For this, you just... you just send your cell phone to the class, you don't have to go, I'm telling the children <laughs> You don't have to go to school, just parcel your uh, cell phone and it'll learn everything and bring back. Already this is happening because of the pandemic, suddenly teachers are wondering what's happening because their relevance is gone. Online it's happening, once it's online they can record it and listen, it to, listen to it whenever they want. So I'm saying a teacher is there not to just give information. Information is far more efficient on recording devices than from a human being. A teacher must be there to inspire, to inspire new... new uh, arenas of exploration within the child. Above all, the most important thing is to explore this one and different possibilities that human being holds. Say you've been a Formula One driver, suppose I'll give you a Ford pickup truck, and I want you to win the Formula One race, will you do it? You may be a great driver, can you do it? I'm asking. I'm saying without... A... Uh, uh, yeah. Well, Sadhguru, uh, I think I'm pretty confident, so yes, I think I could have won even with that. <laughs> that is, you'll bash up all the other cars <laughs> I'm saying to... to perform at a certain level, you want an up... you need an upgraded machine. So similarly, for this one, to perform at a certain level, this needs to be an upgraded machine. Education should be an upgrade of this one, the upgrading human beings to a higher level of function. Rather than that, we're just loading them up with memory, because education is not about enhancing horizons. Education largely today is functioning how to fit individual human beings into the larger economic cog economic machine that's going on and you want a child to be a cog in that. But I think things will change because of technology. This whole thing about people going to work itself may change, except for a few things. A whole lot of things is, as artificial intelligence and other things come, a lot of things that we think are relevant will no more be relevant in another 10-15 years time. I think that way, this school system that we have built, which is more like a correctional, at least now they've stopped beating the children. Otherwise, when we were going to school, every day I have to show my knuckles and then trying to knock off my knuckles. <laughs> uh, Sadhguru, I have to disagree with you on the electric cars. I am convinced that it is a, a long-term brilliant solution. Um, just yesterday, Northvolt in the in Sweden announced that they managed to re they managed to build a material a battery with ninety five percent recycled materials from another older battery. So there is real breakthroughs there, and I do think that that uh, electric cars will be a great solution. Questioning the relevance of an electric car, I'm not questioning the relevance. It is definitely relevant. I'm just saying the way we are progressing is. We will do one mistake and move to the next one, and from there we'll move to the next one. We are not able to think up what is the ultimate thing, because uh, we are going by memory, we are... Uh, we are entangled in our own memory. I meant it that way. I am not saying electric car is not relevant, though uh, I would uh, still prefer something that roars a bit <laughs> I agree with you on that one. Uh, Sadhguru, <laughs> if I may say, um, for me also in the education system, something that is missing, something that I regret in my life um, is understanding and learning about myself as a human being, which is a bit what you were saying. Huh? It's the study of philosophy, the love of wisdom about myself, understanding myself. I spent 10 years working with a philosopher um, once I was 21 years old. That's when I started. Uh, and it was particularly because of the suffering. I had my mental suffering in my sport. I was trying to find ways to help me. And that is something that I can recommend to everybody who is listening as well, to engage on that path. I mean, there's so much material out there, so many great thinkers who have experienced psychological difficulties themselves and who have found solutions to them, you know, just like you, of course.
And I really recommend everybody watching that you engage on that path of, of reading up on it and learning what's, uh, what's out there, you know, about, about yourself. Why, why are you jealous? Why are you anxious before you go into an exam? There is, you can understand that, you know, and if you understand that, it really helps you a lot in life. So that's something that I would recommend. And that brings me to the next question, which is passion. Um, what if students at this point in time, what if you guys watching, you girls watching, some of you don't know, um, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Um, Sadhguru, do you have any idea how, um, which could help them? Uh, see, people are always thinking in terms of what am I passionate about? See, it's not about you being passionate about something. People always ask me, Sadhguru, what do you enjoy, what do you enjoy most? Well, I'm joyful, so whatever the hell I'm doing, I enjoy it. <laughs> Instead of being joyful, you're trying to enjoy. So you are enslaving your joy, that's what it means, enjoy means. I enjoy this thing means you are enslaved, you have enslaved your joy to a specific act. Well. It is important to understand that human experience comes from within, not from outside. Outside may stimulate something within you, but I'm saying, do you want... Uh, I'm asking this to you with a loaded question, you don't have to reveal anything to the students. Would you like a self-start car or a push-start car? Uh, self-start. Yes. This is a loaded question, don't tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> so, it must be self-start. So, I am asking you, your peacefulness, your joy, your love, your blissfulness, should it be on self-start or push-start? It should be on push-start, it should be on push-start, because then I don't depend on it working. Yes, it must be on self-start, it should not be push-start, that somebody need not push it, something need not push it. So, whatever the situation, I am the way I am, this needs to happen. So, right now when I say I am only passionate about this or that, only there I will be involved, only there I will be happy. This is not the way. It is just that life is a very brief happening. Let me put it this way. See, uh, Nico, can I ask how old are you? Uh, Thirty-six. Thirty-six. Thirty-eight years ago, where were you? Uh, um, I was in my mom's... Uh, tom no, 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 before that, thirty-eight, that's why She didn't bear you for two years, only nine months. Okay, yeah, but I was... half of me was in my mom and half of me was in my dad. <laughs> you didn't exist, man <laughs> You did not exist. So, when somebody does not exist, generally we say they are dead, all right? So, in a way, you were dead. So, thirty-six years ago, you were born, now you are, I'll grant you another hundred years, all right? After hundred years, where will you be? Again, you'll be dead. How long will you be dead? For endless amount of time. How long were you dead thirty-eight years ago? Endless amount of time. So when you look at this, you and me are going to be dead for millions of years, all right? But we're alive just for a brief amount of time. Life is a little bit of a sparkle. In that, don't decide where you will fire and where you will not fire. Wherever the hell you are, you must fire, all right? <laughs> Full on, because it's such a brief sparkle. Compared to the amount of time that you will be dead, your aliveness is such a brief sparkle. In this, don't decide what are you passionate about, what are you not. You should be absolutely one hundred percent passionate about every breath that you take. Sadhguru, being passionate over such a long period of time with every breath you take, takes me to endurance. No, 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 let me correct you, it's not such a long amount of time. I'm yeah, telling yeah, you, sorry, it's a very brief, brief sparkle life, even okay. if you live to be hundred and thirty-eight. Okay, nevertheless, for that, we need endurance as well, which takes me to the next question. How important is a, is a strong fighting spirit in life um, for reaching the goals that we aspire to, you know? And also, how do we know when to stop? <laughs> uh, death will stop us, no problem. You don't have to stop, anyway it will stop. This is what I'm trying to remind young people, they're all in school, when I was that age, uh, I never thought I will get old, <laughs> okay? I never thought I'm going to die either. <laughs> That's the last thing on my mind. So, I thought, uh, you know, this is it, youth. But the thing is, every old person that you see struggling on the road to walk was a young, sprightly young person just like you. 
jumping all over the place. And now life has become like this. And that happens so quickly, you don't know how quickly it happens. If you are living very joyfully, it will happen very quickly. Only if you are living a miserable life, you will have a long life. Because this is the experience of a human being. Time is a very relative experience in human life. If you are very joyful on a given day, twenty-four hours, poof, it just goes like that. If you are miserable and depressed, twenty-four hours feels like a eon, all right? So long life is only for people who are miserable. If you are joyful and sprightly, life before you know what's happening, it'll be over <laughs> It's not long at all. So how to be passionate? You don't have to be passionate for your life. You just have to be passionate this moment, wherever you are. Thank you very much. And, um, and I, I know that you are very passionate about the planet and the soil, um, which I just looked at a YouTube video from you as well, actually. I mean, the initiatives you're launching is very, very impactful, so very inspiring. Um, can you take us through a little bit what you're working on, like towards the sustainability and, and what can everybody who's watching, how can we maybe contribute to support you? See, uh, how they can act, uh, everything, we will come to it later because the campaign will start from uh, 1st of March. And from there on, for one hundred days, it is kept up because I am riding from London to southern India through twenty-four nations, thirty thousand kilometers on a motorcycle at the age of sixty-five, wanting to kill myself, you understand <laughs> So, <laughs> I'm doing this because we want to change the narrative in the world, we want people to sit up and look. We have agricultural soil only for another eighty crops on the planet. This is... every responsible scientist is saying this. This is approximately forty-five to sixty years. What is our legacy? We need to understand soil is not our property, it's our legacy. What was given to us, we need to pass it on. First thing that young people must understand is, soil is not some kind of dead material, it is living soil, it is alive. A handful of soil in southern India has over five billion organisms in it, over ten thousand to thirty thousand species in a handful of soil. So, this is a living entity. It is from this a plant grows, it is from this a tree comes, it is from this a grasshopper flies, it is from this an elephant comes, it is from this you and me have come. Either you get it now or you will get it from the maggots one day anyway, all right? But if you get it now, we can make a difference because the biodiversity in the world's soil is disappearing so rapidly that if we do not do something about it, so there's a simple course of action that we want to put it in the policy of 192 countries, that minimum three percent organic content should be there in agricultural soils. Do whatever you want, we will provide you hundreds of ways in which it can be done. But the important thing is, before our life passes, all agricultural lands on this planet must have a minimum of three percent. This is the most minimum, I'm asking. This will keep the biodiversity alive. If you make it six to twelve percent, you will have rich lands. If you make it seventy percent, you will have a rainforest. But minimum three percent to see that we leave a legacy of living soil to, to future generations. As a part of this, an elaborate system of activating various influences from across the world. We're doing this. Nico, you must uh, get all the racing people to talk about soil for these hundred days. We want everybody to talk soil for these hundred days in their own way, on their own platforms. And uh, we want this to become the thing because we have prepared a soil policy document. We are working with the various agencies like UNCCD and the World Economic uh, Forum and various other agencies to see that this becomes the policy in the world. Initially as a recommendation, later on it has to become mandatory because we are destroying our soil at a pace where we cannot recover. If we go another twenty-five to thirty years without any action, it'll be very hard to recover from that state. May I ask, Sadhguru, have you already seen suffering as a result close to your home uh, in India? Oh, yes, very much. Uh, see, one thing is, in India in the last twenty years, over three hundred thousand farmers have committed suicide, okay? It's always been explained off as, oh, he couldn't pay back his loan, that's why he committed suicide, this happened, that happened. But tell me, if you are a farmer and your soil is rich, will you commit suicide? Is it possible? 
If your soil is rich and it bears food for you, will you commit suicide? No, it's become a heartbreaking job because nearly sixty percent of India's soil, which was one of the richest soils in the world at one time, because we started agriculture way before the rest of the world did. Last ten to twelve thousand year history is there in, in many parts of India where agriculture has happened. So, we have depleted the soil, but these twelve thousand years we managed the soil well. But in the last forty years, since we industrialized our agricultural process, since then we have depleted the soil to such a point, in nearly sixty percent of our soil, the organic content is less than point five percent. To call soil as soil, it takes minimum three percent, but we are less than point five percent. This desolation that has spread across the country, you can see very clearly. We are making efforts on ground. We have taken up eighty-three thousand square kilometers of Kaveri River Basin as an experimental thing and uh, here rejuvenation is happening at a great pace. But another thirteen river basins we want to do, but above all, we want to do this across the planet. It can't be done by any one individual or organization. This is why we want this to come into the policy of every nation, that agricultural soil or soil per se is not our property. It's a legacy that we have received from pre previous generations. We have to pass it on that way to future generations. Living soil. Let me tell you one little uh, on a lighter note. This happened in 2050. A few scientists uh, sought an appointment with God. Uh, they got it and they went there and they said, Hey old man, you've done pretty well with creation, but everything that you can do, we can do now. You t it's time you retire. So God said, oh, is that so? What can you do? They just dug up some soil and made the form of a little child and did this and that, it did all kinds of uh, science to it and it came alive. The child came alive. God said, oh, that's very impressive, but first get your own soil. We need to understand soil is the base of all life on this planet, but we are destroying it right now. We need to do something about it. I request all the young people, all of you, the racing fraternity, to stand up for soil for this hundred days so that we want to move over 3.5 billion people, which is over sixty percent of the world's electorate. In democratic nations, the only currency is numbers, people. If you move three billion people, no government will ignore it and everybody will bring it into their policy. And uh, this is what we are doing right now. I want all of you with me. Well, thank you so much, Sadhguru, for your contribution, huh, which is going to be benefit all of us and, and the next generations in the future. Um, if, I, if I may then, speaking about future, there's a, a big, big trending word at the moment, which is uh, metaverse. So uh, if it's okay, I wanted to touch on that uh, with you. Um, do you think that, uh, that this is just another like evolution or um, which could be positive in many ways? Or do you definitely say, okay, here we're moving down the wrong direction more and more and more? See, uh, I am always on metaverse. I'm not uh, wearing those uh, horrible glasses, but I got them fixed in my eyes. <laughs> so if people had seen every leaf, every insect, every worm, every tree, every life on this planet, every aspect of life on this planet, on other aspects of rocks and soil and everything, the way I see it, uh, they wouldn't need any external technology. How does this happen? I must tell you this, this happened to me because when I was four and a half years of age, I suddenly realized one day, I do not know anything. Do not know anything means do not know anything at all. Because I do not know anything, I started paying attention. See, when you don't know nothing, you will pay enormous attention. Suppose you are walking in a well-lit room, uh, without attention you will go about. If we turn off the lights and make it pitch dark, then you will see you will become super attentive, simply because you do not know where the next step is. So when you really realize that you do not know, the power of I do not know is too tremendous. Unfortunately, this whole internet generation knows everything about the galaxies, just like that from their phone screen. It's very important to realize I do not know, because when you truly realize I do not know, your intelligence will be on all the time, your attention will be on all the time, and your sense perception will heighten itself in many different ways. You have heard somebody who is blind of vision becomes so super sensitive in his ears. He can hear things that nobody else can hear. 
simply because he is not able to see this, so everything else enhances. So I do not know is that power. I know is just an assumption. It's just we are assuming things because we have information. So it is very, very important that you realize I do not know. And once you realize I do not know, then everything enhances itself and it's a metaverse all the time. Without external aids, you will be in a metaverse. So am I against metaverse? Not at all. I want every human being to be on metaverse. But why are you creating an alternate reality when you have not even enjoyed the reality the way it is? Because you think everything has to be painted bright for you to get attention. There is a way to enhance your attention in such a way, if you spend a million years on this planet, it will not be exhausted. You will not get bored, because there is so much means there is so much. As I said, a, a handful of soil has over a billion, over five billion uh, organisms. Is it something that will get over now with metaverse? Maybe these organisms will get colored in multiple colors and you will see them. I don't know what you will see, but you are seeing an alternate reality. Reality is very important. Alternate reality, another word for alternate reality is illusion. You can enjoy illusions for some time, but if you get lost in your illusion, there's no way out. There's simply no way out. If you get in lost in reality, you can use your GPS and find your way back. But if you get lost in your illusion, there is no way out, because if you find your way, you're completely lost. That is the nature of an illusion. So, we must be careful how we explore these things, how, at what age children go on these things. I must tell you this, can I, can I share an episode, a small uh, incident, you know? When my daughter was growing up, when she was like nine, ten, eleven years of age, she was reading literature, which I read when I was eighteen, twenty years of age. She started reading English classics. So, this literature is written in such a powerful way, that you have a whole... When, when you're reading that book for that one week or ten days, you are living in an alternate reality of your own, different characters, different atmosphere, everything. And it got her so engaged, that she became dazed. So teachers started complaining, complaining, she's simply blankly looking without listening to anything, and uh, she doesn't know where she is because these... all these new characters that she's read about are playing in her head. And uh, she comes home and uh, she starts reading the book, and after six hours I see she's still reading the book. Then I knew I had to break it because uh, if she goes like this, you know, you... illusion, Illusory things that are happening in your mind will become more real than the real. Then I made it a point every day that she walks in the forest, she climbs a tree, she does something in the natural world. And that broke and then she started enjoying the literature for what it is. Otherwise, the literature that she was reading was becoming real in her head. So, I'm saying in a way, literature is metaverse if it's written well, and if you read it, it just expands in your mind in such a way and it becomes an alternate reality. So many people are lost in such things already. Metaverse is a much, much more powerful device in that direction, and especially children could get completely lost in it. So we must uh, see how to use it. I'm not against any technology, because every technology has positives and negatives, depend up, depending upon how we use it. How we use it is what we need to look at it. The question is not whether the technology is good or not. All technology is fantastic, as far as I'm concerned. How we use it needs to be thought out. If the more consciously we use it, the more beneficial it can be. Um, Sadhguru, um, one thing that I want to touch on, which is part of what you mentioned, I was something who had a lot of, uh, someone who had a lot of self-doubt. You know, I never thought that I could win the next race, that I was good enough. Uh, I had a lot of self-doubt. Um, but actually, for all of you watching as well, who are not sure that you can do well in your job or succeed or, or, or whatever, having self-doubt and not being so convinced and in your, uh, in your words, uh, Sadhguru, what was the words you were using? Uh... No, uh, thinking that you know everything. So not thinking that you know everything and having doubts and being unsure, that is, can actually, of course, it sometimes is quite difficult and can cause some difficulties, but it's actually, we need to understand sometimes a great strength to be in reality, to question what is going on around you, to improve yourself, question.
position yourself, you know, be in the now. Um, so actually you can turn it into a strength if you're, uh, if you, uh, if you really try to start to understand that. And so this is just a little word of wis wisdom uh, that I learned as well on my path. See, doubt is the only reason why you look at things closely, all right? Now, about not knowing there is no doubt, I'm telling you it's hundred percent, we do not know a damn thing about this existence. Now, with all the scientific exploration, we still do not know how a single atom is in its entirety. We know how to use it, we know how to fuse it, we know how to break it, we know all those things. But we don't know what it is, so we really don't know, there's no doubt about it. Put that in context of your racing, in a race you definitely do not know who will win this race. It's foolish to think I will win or you will win. Definitely you do not know. I want to win is different. I will win is a silly idea, okay? I want to win, yes, without that fire you can't do anything. But I'm anyway going to win is a silly idea. You may kill yourself do with such ideas, you know? Especially in uh, situations where your physical self is involved, it could mean life or death. If you believe I will, it will happen anyway. Well, it may give you confidence. So this is the biggest disaster about human beings. They have worked to develop confidence, not clarity. When you're racing, you don't need confidence, you need clarity. You need clarity of vision, clarity of purpose, clarity of action. You don't need confidence, with confidence you will do silly things. Confidence is a dangerous thing. I know everybody is working for being confident, please don't be confident. It is very important that you have clarity. What you can see, you can see hundred percent. What you cannot see, you cannot see. This must be very clear in your head. When you have clarity, you will do things effortlessly. When you have confidence, you will do it with enormous amount of underlying fear and you will suffer that all the time and it may not produce any results because who doesn't want to win a race? Everybody wants to win a race. The guy who is every time coming in the last, even he is wanting to win a race, that's why he's there, all right? That's why he's there, he's just hoping all the twenty-four cra cars will crash and he will come first. But will that happen? <laughs> it may, someday. <laughs> That's confidence <laughs> uh, Sadhguru, you're speaking about racing. Of course, time is a big, uh, is a big factor in racing as well. Um, do you think it's a human-made concept? I mean, to say it quite extremely, like for example, social media, it helps us to connect, but um, it also can give us a lot of negative feelings as we know. I mean, it really is quite a problem out there as well. So what do you think about that whole evolution? <laughs> now that you talked about uh, time and speed and racing, uh, someone came to me that they wanted their motorcycle autographed. So I said, speed, speed crushes time and space. But let it not be your bones, you just have to take care it's not your bones on a motorcycle. <laughs> it can also crush bones. <laughs> so, <laughs> speed definitely crushes time and space. So what is time and space? See, in the yogic uh, sciences, we see everything as time. There is no time and space, there is time and time. For both time and space, there's only one word called kala. Kala means time, kala means empty space also. So, only because there is time, there is space. Modern physics doesn't look at it this way, but the yogic sciences, we see it this way. Only because there is time, there is space. Because, let's say there is one second, you can move from here to here. Not because there is space, there is time. Because there is time, there is space. This is something you will have to twist your brains to understand this or come to an inner experience to see that. Time is the only reality in the existence. Everything else is a consequence of time. Kala or Mahakala is the only reality in the existence. Everything is an outcome of that, space. Because of space, material, because of material, atom, because of atom, you and me. Time is the only reality. You see, right now people's understanding of time is circular motion. If the planet spins once, this is a day. If the moon goes around, it's a month. If the planet goes around, it's a year. So your idea of time right now is all cyclical. 
So your idea of time and physical existence are so closely related. Right now, change of seasons, spinning of the planet, spinning of the revolutions or rotations of the moon and planet, this is what is determining time for you. No, that is one level of time, which is cyclical movement of physical objects. This is why everything that's physical in the existence, from a simple atom to galaxies and cosmic uh, aspects, everything is in cyclical motion because they're all enslaved to time. But this manifestation of cyclical movement of objects as time is a human experience of it. But there is time, only because there is time, there is space. They are not two different things, they are the same thing. Thank you very much for those uh, wise words of wisdom. And, and um, I mean, <laughs> in our world today, we see, we see people like Elon Musk uh, trying to go for new planets. Um, do you, what do you, like, what do you think to that? Do you think uh, it's, it, that's like, uh, that's the wrong way because it's an avoidance and we should be actually our, treasuring the planet that we have rather than thinking about some plan B already? Uh, I'm not against new planets, but before we go to another planet, first we must learn to take care of this planet because otherwise we'll go there and do the same silly things that we have done here. So, first becoming a consciously figuring out, creating a conscious planet here, so that we figure out what is the best way to live on this planet, then please populate the whole cosmos, I have no problem. But without knowing how to live on this planet, you go to another planet, what do you do there? Another see a story of destruction, isn't it? Um, Sadhguru, if I can ask, um, recently, I mean, everybody was watching, you know, we have our mental challenges and everything. What is something that you learned in your life just recently or you've seen that was really a breakthrough where you thought, hey, that's, uh, that's very, very, uh, very interesting or you applied it to your life? Some words of wisdom maybe now with an example for everybody who is watching. So you said we all have our mental challenges. Why is mind a challenge? Mind is a tremendous possibility. Why have we made our own mind a challenge? So essentially we are saying our intelligence is a serious problem. You tell me, Nico, is intelligence a source of solution or is it a source of problems? Well, it, it, it's a definite source of solutions, yes. but it also, of course, provides us with challenges along the way. Uh, that is because we do not know how to harness our intelligence. Absolutely, but that is a grand challenge. If you're, if you're riding a horse, if you know how to ride a horse well, it's a great possibility. If you are being kicked by a horse, of course it's a big problem. Right now, <laughs> most people are being kicked around by their own mind. This is why I said the first question that you raised about education, the most important thing is, we are not teaching our children how to handle this machine first, how to take charge of this. Because without taking charge of this, whatever you touch, you will make a disaster out of it. Because this is out of control. See, in the evolutionary scale of things, from a single-celled amoeba to who you are right now, it has taken millions of years of research and development. You can call it evolution, but essentially it's research and development that nature has been doing to get you to this place of complexity. Many times it made small mistakes and again it corrected itself and this is how we have become who we are. So today, on the planet, at least on this planet, we are the most evolved, most sophisticated in terms of physiology and psychological structure. So this intelligence should be a solution for every life on this planet. But instead of that, we have become a problem for every life on this planet. This is simply because we have not harnessed it. We are enslaved to it. Once you have this level of competence and this level of capability, this level of awareness and intelligence, you can only address this and handle this consciously. Right now, we are still handling this level of intelligence and competence like any other creature compulsively. So if, if an ant is compulsive and it climbs all over you, it's okay, you can wave him off. But if an elephant climbs all over you, it is going to cause absolute destruction. That's exactly what human activity is right now. If any other creature had done what we are doing to this planet right now, like for example, let's say a million locusts 
or a trillion locusts came from Mars and landed here and started eating up everything, then we would immediately come up with a plan how to exterminate every one of them, gas them, poison them, do whatever. But now it's us. Why have we become like this? The problem is not our intelligence. The problem is our unconscious compulsive behavior. It is time we create a conscious planet. Thank you very much, Sadhguru. Those were some very nice, um, nice final words, I would say. Um, so I, at this I'm, point, I'm, I'm going to be still alive and be going to speaking a lot of things about conscious planet. I want yourself, your racing community, and all the children in the schools to take this up and really change the narrative on the planet. Soil is the source of our life. We must make sure it stays rich. If this life has to be good and every life has to be good, our soil must have necessary strength in it. Unfortunately, it's suffering a lot. Let's make it happen. Thank you very much for everybody listening. Sadhguru, it was a big honor to speak to you. You're a huge inspiration also to me uh, all the time to keep pushing uh, and keep making progress in this direction. So thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. When I'm in, when I'm in Europe, we're going to race, but I'm on two wheels. So don't yes, no, with... Sadhguru, please be careful huh, with your 30,000 <laughs> miles around the world. No, really, I hope you're going to be careful on your journey. Because I remember yes. you did that when you were a young, uh, a young 20-year-old. I hope you don't think you're still 20, huh? Like when you're going through the corners, maybe a little bit more easier huh, than when you were 20 years old, huh? <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you, Nico. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Bye-bye. Tschüss an euch alle. Danke fürs Zuschauen. Tschüss. Namaskaram. Thank you.